So we'll start out by suggesting that uh, the empty tomb is important because you take any of the greatest prophets of any religion, any important person, and the most famous attestation to their legacy is where they're buried. Okay, and so you take the Old Testament prophets and they say that Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi are buried and they have a, a place where they're buried out there on the Mount of Olives. Uh, if you take Gandhi, Gandhi's ashes are in a uh, <clears throat> urn in a museum in India. If you take Muhammad, Muhammad is buried beneath the green dome in Medina. And so that is the major attestation to anybody that's made an impact in the world is their burial ground and their dead body being located there. Nobody has made a bigger impact on the world than Jesus Christ, and yet Jesus Christ is the one that has an empty tomb. There's no place where you can find his body, no memorial where his dead bones are or where his ashes are. He's the only one where the tomb, his tomb was found empty. So that's a big deal just to compare that the idea that his tomb was found empty uh, so let's look at his this idea of his tomb being found empty let's just first of all frame the story in the gospel of john and then we'll go on to some other talking points so the gospel of john chapter 19 verse 38 <clears throat> john 19 and verse 38, after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, asked Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came and took his body. Nicodemus also, who earlier had come to Jesus by night, came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about 75 pounds in weight. That would have been worth a lot of money, and that's going to come up a little bit later. So they took the body of Jesus, they bound it in linen cloths with the spices, as is the burial custom of the Jews. And now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden. And in the garden, there was a new tomb, which no one had yet been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, since the tomb was close, they had laid Jesus there. Now on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb early, while it was still dark, and saw that the stone had been rolled away from the tomb. And so she ran and went to Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one whom Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've laid him. So Peter went out with the other disciple, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple ran, outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths lying there, but he did not go in. So this is John that saw the linen cloths, and that was enough for John. He didn't bother going in. But Simon Peter, the impetuous one, Simon Peter came following him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which had been on Jesus' head, was not lying with the linen cloths, but it was folded up, in a place by itself. Then the other disciple who had reached the tomb first also went in and he saw and he believed for as yet they did not understand the scripture that he must rise from the dead. So the disciples went back to their homes. So that's our account of the empty tomb. We already went into um, the legitimacy of John's gospel last week or several weeks ago when we had our class before the break the um, attestation of the New Testament scriptures. So here we have an empty tomb, and one of the historical parts that is super important when we come to this is that the, G the, the Jews had anticipated uh, a plot of some kind that the disciples might want to come and remove Jesus' body. Jesus had already told the Jews uh, that, that he would give them the sign of Jonah, and the sign of Jonah was that Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days, and after three days he was loosed, and he said that that would happen to him as well. So he had let the Jews know, I'm going to be in the ground for three days, and after three days I'm going to rise. So this is an important historical fact. The Jews were well aware that he was supposed to rise after three days. <clears throat> 
anything that might perpetuate this thing that they did not like. And so in rather than risking the body coming up missing, the Jews did everything they could to, to, to uh, protect that tomb so that nobody could take the body. This is a big historical... Yeah. So let's read an account of uh, what they did because we have a corroborating evidence. That's important when we're looking at history. Is there more than one person that can corroborate the story? Let's go back to the book of Matthew. And Matthew is going to corroborate the empty tomb, but he's also going to give us more information about the Jews trying to prevent anybody from being able to steal the body. <clears throat> so we'll go over to Matthew chapter 27. Matthew uh, is one of the later of the Gospels. Uh, I believe it went Mark was first, Luke was next, Matthew was next, John was last. So by the time Matthew writes his Gospel, we uh, take it to be about 70 A.D., so it's been 40 years since Christ's uh, death, burial, and resurrection. And so Matthew is going to cover some topics that maybe some of the earlier Gospels didn't cover because of the rumors and stuff that had developed in those 40 years. So Matthew chapter 27 and verse 62. And we're looking for the Jewish leaders trying to prevent anybody from being able to take the body. The next day, one of the preparation day, the chief priests and the Pharisees went to Pilate. Sir, they said, we remember that while he was still alive, that deceiver said, after three days I will rise again. So give the order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. The last deception will be worse than the first. Take a guard, Pilate answered. Go make the tomb as secure as you know how. And so they went and they made the tomb secure by putting a seal on the stone and by posting the guard. So a couple elements um, that we want to be make sure we focus in on is the Jews anticipated someone attempting to take the body. They went and they procured help from Rome, and Rome gave them carte blanche. Rome gave them soldiers and said, make the tomb as secure as you know how. Carte blanche from the Roman government to do whatever you need to do to make sure nobody gets in that tomb. And that's a massive uh, point in this whole uh, episode that we look at. Uh, the Roman seal, what did that mean to put a Roman seal on the stone? The Roman seal, the power behind the Roman seal was crucifixion. Anybody that breaks this seal will suffer Rome's wrath, and that would have been crucifixion. Uh, you've heard the phrase, don't mess with Texas. Well, don't mess with Rome was a much more persuasive uh, phrase. Don't mess with Rome. So that was a massive implement there. Second was this idea of being able to post. <laughs> Second is this, this word here. Um, the, the word that's translated a guard has a monumental significance in this episode because really what the text says is Pilate gave them a Roman custodian. A custodian was um, the typical, like, I guess, um, anti-riot type police. A custodian was anywhere from four to 16 soldiers. But what they would do is they would line up four sets of four Roman soldiers. <laughs> and these, this custodian, this, this, this guard... Um, What's interesting is the United States Army uh, reprinted, what was it called? The U.S. Army has reprinted a copy of the Military Institutions of the Romans by Flavius Renatus. The Military Institutions of the Romans. They reprinted this manuscript 
and it was used by the U.S. military in order to train the Green Berets. I don't know if you're familiar with Rome's legacy, but the, um, the legion, oh, no, no, it wasn't a legion. The Roman, anyway, it was what made Rome so lethal. So the U.S. Army actually studied Rome's tactics in war, and they used those to form the basis of the training for the Green Berets. Well, one of the things that's documented in that book is exactly what the Roman custodian was. And it was four groups of four wide that was an impenetrable force for the Roman army. Each man was a fighting machine. Each man had between five and six weapons. They were experts in their field. Their job was to protect six square yards each against a superior force. The reputation was that 16 men four square, four wide, four deep, could stand their ground while battling an entire battalion of the army, of the enemy. So this was a massive force. Uh, we actually see this same force in Acts when they came out to escort Peter out of town. So let's look at Acts. This would be pretty interesting. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 and verse 4. <clears throat> Acts 12 and verse 4, uh, when they had seized him, uh, they put him in prison and they delivered him over to four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending after the Passover to bring him out uh, to the people. So four squads of soldiers, four groups of four, same thing as a Roman custodian. Now, if they brought out that many soldiers to guard Peter, one of the disciples of this rabbi, how many would they have taken any smaller precaution in trying to guard the body of Jesus? So it's the same. In fact, they would have probably taken more precaution. So the Roman custodian is very significant. Who is going to mess with that? And then in addition to the Roman custodian, which Pilate gave to um, the Jews, the Jews had their own temple police, 270 temple police. Now, the text doesn't say that they were stationed. But when Pilate gave the Jews carte blanche, do whatever you want, make it as secure as possible. We know that they at least had the Roman custodian and probably some of their own temple police is what you would assume. They had as many as 270. At, so major fact in the drama is that the Jews were given carte blanche to protect this tomb so that nobody could take the body of the empty tomb and an explanation by Matthew as to what the guards had to do because the body had disappeared. Let's look at Matthew chapter 28. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 28. Twenty-eight and verse 1. After the Sabbath, at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, he rolled back the stone and he sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and they became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he laid. So that's the account that the soldiers were not allowed to, or were not successful in stopping the body from coming up missing. And um, an angel announces that Jesus had been resurrected and so now we're switching from A, the Jews have been given the opportunity to take any means necessary to prevent his disappearance. After. And I have heard people say when Jesus. Beautiful. So when the first act of the Jews uh, was not successful, we're going to look at Act 2 of the Jews. The first act to prevent it was unsuccessful. So now, Act 2, Matthew 28 and verse 11. While the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and they reported to the chief priests everything that happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders, they devised a plan. 
They gave the soldiers a large sum of money, and they told him, You are to say to his disciples came during the night, and they stole him away while we were asleep. Now the problem with this is a Roman soldier, if a Roman soldier ever failed at his job, he was executed. You don't do your job right, you die. So here are 16 men that are going to face uh, execution. What are the odds that 16 men fell asleep? Okay, so you are to say that his disciples came and stole him away while we were asleep. Now, if the report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and we will keep you out of trouble. So this is what waylaid their fear of being beheaded. Yeah. So the soldiers took the money and they did as they were told. And this story has been widely circulated amongst the Jews to this very day. That's an interesting little tagline that uh, 40 years after Jesus' crucifixion, Matthew is drawing attention to the fact that the first attempt of the Jews didn't work. So the second attempt was to invent a lie. And he's saying this lie has been circulated amongst the Jews to this very day. That's why they say Matthew records the lie. Since it was a lie, the fact they didn't kill the people cooperated. This is the way they cooperate their story. Yeah, yeah. And the Jews had a lot of pull. We're going to see that the Jews had a lot of pull with Herod and, uh, and in Rome. And so the Jews could very well get some people excused, uh, whereas that would not normally happen. So there's the, uh, the account there. Um, it's the second corroborating account of the empty tomb, but Matthew is the first one to tell us that the Jews invented a lie and that that was perpetuated. I'm going to go into some extra biblical um, documents. This was written by Justin Martyr. Justin Martyr uh, was a Christian, but he was trying to convert a Jew. His name was Trypho, and they were in Ephesus. Interesting about Ephesus, right? Because that's where Revelation was written to. So Justin Martyr was in Ephesus with a guy named Trypho, a Jew, and Ju Justin Martyr is telling the Jew the lies that the Jew have perpetuated, and he's trying to convince Trypho that uh, Christ really was, trying to get him to switch to Christianity. And so we have this recorded in his dialogue. Like I said, guys, someday I'll, I'll put all this in a little book and I'll give you all the photocopies of all the books that I've bought. I bought almost every one of these books so that I could highlight and photocopy exactly the documentation of the evidence. So here is how the discussion goes. Uh, Though all the men in your nation knew the incidents of the life of Jonah, and though Christ said amongst you that he would give you the sign of Jonah, exhorting you to repent of your wicked deeds at least after he rose again from the dead, and to mourn before God as did the Ninevites, in order that your nation and your city might not be destroyed. Did Jerusalem end up getting destroyed? No. As they have been destroyed, as they have already been destroyed, yet you not only have not repented, but after you learned that he rose from the dead, as I said before, you have sent and chosen ordained men throughout all the world to proclaim that a godless, lawless heresy sprung up from one Jesus, a Galilean deceiver whom we crucified. So there's another extra biblical reference to the crucifixion of Christ, but also he's corroborating the lie that the Jews created, which Matthew already told us about. So there's corroboration. Okay. But his disciples, but you said that his disciples stole him by night from the tomb when he was laid there after having been unfastened from the cross. Two sources now list uh, the idea that the Jews created the lie that the disciples stole him. And so now there is actually a third one, a guy named Tertullian, but I'm going to save him for just a little bit. Um, so obviously as believers, we know Christ was resurrected. But what the Jews said in order to fend off the idea of his resurrection is they said that his body was stolen. So let's look at the idea. Is it even plausible 
that somebody could have stolen the body. Let's take a peek at that. Uh, in Mark 14.50, the first suggestion against the possibility of that is that the disciples were all terrified. The disciples were all afraid, and they all went into hiding. Mark 14.50, all the disciples deserted him, and they fled. Christ was left alone at the cross. Uh, John chapter 20 and verse 19, on the evening of that day, the first day of the week, they were all behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jews. So after the, um, after the uh, crucifixion, they were all hiding out because they were afraid of the Jews. And then in Acts chapter 12, we see this, that the Jews had a real in with Rome. And so Rome would have been on the side of the Jews. Acts chapter 12 and verse 1. About that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death by the sword. When he saw that this pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. So we see uh, one of the uh, procurators or whatever Herod was of the of the uh, Rome was more than happy to kill Christians because it made the Jews happy and he wanted to be in good with them. Now Peter was sitting outside in the courtyard and a servant girl came up to him and said, you also were with Jesus the Galilean. But he denied it before them all saying, I don't know what you mean. And when he went out to the entrance, another servant girl saw him, and she said to the bystanders, This man was with Jesus of Nazareth. And again he denied it with an oath, I do not know the man. After a little while, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, Certainly you too are one of them, for your accent betrays you. Then he began to invoke a curse on himself and to swear, I do not know the man. And immediately the rooster crowed, and Jesus remembered the saying of Peter, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And he went out and he wept bitterly. So the likelihood that the disciples would have braved this Roman custodian, plus the possibility of the temple soldiers of the Jews, when they're all hiding for fear of their life, very unlikely. That's number one. Number two is to note that the disciples, most of them didn't understand that Christ was going to be resurrected. And even after he's resurrected, most of them didn't believe. Two cases, uh, John 20 and 13, the angel asked the woman, why are you weeping? She said, because they've taken my Lord away and I don't know where they put him. Her first thought was not that he resurrected. Her first thought was that somebody came and took him. Uh, the second one, Doubting Thomas, John 20, 25. The other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But Thomas said, unless I see the nail marks in his hands, put my finger where the nails were and my hand into his side, I will never believe. The disciples either didn't understand or didn't believe that Jesus would be resurrected from the dead. What's that? What do you think it was that they didn't understand? You talked about not knowing what you're signing up for. Yeah. So the sheer terror of the disciples, the fact that they went into hiding, the fact that the Jews were given uh, carte blanche to protect this and, and prevent it from happening, uh, the knowable data suggests otherwise. His body couldn't have been stolen. Uh, number two, later on, closer to the second century, the Jews invented another um, way to explain the missing body, and it was that the gardener came and took him, but this was a later development. Tertullian is the one that tells us about this later development from the Jews. Uh, he was a Christian writer from Carthage in Africa around 150 to 200 A.D., so quite a bit later, and he writes this in his... Um, uh, Annals. Um, <clears throat> in the late second century, Tertullian summarized the Jewish argument about the empty tomb. This was the Jewish argument. This is he whom the disciples secretly stole away. 
that it might be said that he had risen from the dead, or the gardener had taken him. So it's interesting that as time went by, they started coming up with other possible explanations because by this time, by 200 AD, the great persecution of Domitian, which is what we're reading about in the book of Revelation, all the martyrs, all the people that had been beheaded, all the people that had been killed, so many people had been killed either by the Jews or by Rome for this belief in the resurrection that they said somebody would have negated somebody there's no way that this many people would die if somebody really stole the body nobody this many people wouldn't die for a lie is what they're gathering so we got to come up with something else so by 200 they came up with the idea that maybe the gardener took him um, notice that Tertullian mentioned something that neither Matthew nor Justin had reported. Um, primarily, the, Jewish, the primary Jewish response was that the disciples stole the body, but some Jews argued that maybe a gardener had removed the body because of how implausible the argument was that the disciples, in light of their suffering and their martyrdom. So as soon as people were willing to die, it became implausible that this whole thing was a lie. Tertullian. The last theory, and it's more of a modern one, was grave robbers. Maybe grave robbers came and stole him. So if we look back at John's account, there are some things in John's account that when we look at the data, the available data would say, nope, there weren't grave robbers either. So let's take a look at that. Yeah, and that was why we covered the death uh, two weeks ago. The grave robber scenario is a more modern one, so let's look at the possibility of that. John chapter 20 and verse 3. So Peter went out with the other disciples, and they were going towards the tomb. Both of them were running together, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. Stooping in, he looked in, and he saw the linen cloths lying there. So play detective. See if you can figure out. What would the linen cloths lying there, what would that tell us? Mm. But they did not go in. And then Simon Peter came following him, and he went into the tomb, and he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the face cloth, which was on Jesus' head, was not lying with the linen cloths, but it was folded up, and it was placed in a self, in a place by itself. If you were Colombo, there's a lot of details right there that would suggest uh, these weren't grave robbers. So here's what you want to be aware of. Um, another. Back up also to the custodian, the yeah. guards, and yeah. the seal. When you go back to that. Yeah, thanks for. Uh, I forgot. That's another testimony is that seal, that Roman seal. Yeah, there's a lot there. And who knows how many of the Jewish uh, police they might have stored there, too. So, yeah. Grave robbers? There were definitely this, in verse 11 on down. Yeah. Jewels or... Yeah. 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 So, good. You, you guys picked up on it. The, the accounts themselves, the data, the available data, leads you to conclude, no, this is not about grave robbers. Uh, and so um, there are a couple fragments, and this is fascinating, but I have not been able to actually buy these books uh, to actually have photocopies, but I've got the quotes here. Uh, Most scholars think that the very presence of the burial clothes in the tomb led John, the beloved disciple, to conclude that the body had not been stolen. Who's going to fold up the head rag and place it not neatly aside and leave the other rags the grave robbers would not have taken the time to unwrap the body, giving themselves the burden of carrying a stiff, decaying, uh, decomposed, naked corpse around. Bloodied and dropping 75 pounds of, of uh, spices and myrrhs and stuff. 75 pounds, that would have been a huge amount of money back then. So if these guys are grave robbers, why would they have lost all that? This is the ex ancient explanation uh, another guy, Grass, cites a Coptic apocryphal fragment. I wish I had that. Pilate, 
is called by the Jewish authorities to come see the tomb from which Jesus' body had been stolen. But when Pilate sees the burial clothes, he observes that if the body had been stolen, the wrappings would have been taken as well. So according to a Coptic fragment, Pilate even went and witnessed this and said this wasn't uh, a theft. Chrysostom, now we're getting way beyond my, my league, but another ancient writer phrases the argument. He created the argument about the uh, theft of the body. Anyone had removed the body, he would not have stripped it first. He would, have taken, he would not have taken the trouble to remove and roll up the headpiece and put it in a place all by itself. And then there's one other quote from the Acts of Pilate. Uh, a man quotes the Acts of Pilate like the Acts of the Apostles. Apparently that was a popular genre, the Acts of whoever. Uh, he quotes the Acts of Pilate as saying the same thing, that Pilate went and saw it and said his body couldn't have been stolen because the thieves would not have left all this behind. Uh, my understanding is that they don't have a manuscript of the Acts of Pilate. All we have is a manuscript that quotes the Acts of Pilate. So there's a lot there. Um, and then there's another argument about having removed the stone. Uh, the Greek says that the stone was put out of place, like it was moved way out of the way. And if a thief was going to try to move this huge stone and get in, he would just move it far enough to squeeze through there. But the Greek sense of it means that the stone was completely moved out of the way. So the angel left no doubt that this was a miraculous occurrence. Um, okay, so now, having covered that, uh, the three ideas of theft, um, really, the data that we have, they don't really fly. So you're left having to come up with something else, and the resurrection is the only reasonable conclusion. So the other thing is, well, if the Jews, if Jesus actually did resurrect from the dead, wouldn't the Jews have believed a resurrection from the dead? Now, hopefully you're bing, bing, bing. There's scriptures going off in your mind about Resurrection from the dead. Let me give you a couple of them. Uh, John 12 and 9, uh, when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, you would think that the Jews would want to go see Lazarus, and if they see Lazarus alive, they would believe that Jesus was who he said he was. They did want to go see Lazarus and not yeah. alive. They did want to go see Lazarus. So John 12 and 9, when the large crowd of the Jews learned that Jesus was there, they came not only on account of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to put Lazarus to death as well, because on account of him, many of the Jews were going away. So the resurrection of the dead would not have convinced the Jews. The second one was when Jesus tells the story of uh, who's in heaven and who's in hell. Father Abraham is there. And uh, the guy that apparently is suffering torment in Hades uh, sees his brothers still on earth. And so he begs Abraham, please go tell my brothers about this place because I don't want them to come here. And he says, they have Moses and the prophets. He sends them to the scriptures. He says, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them read Moses and the prophets. There's something powerful in that answer about how we testify to people today the powers in the scriptures. But he says, no, not Moses and the prophets. Resurrect someone from the dead because if you send them someone from the dead, then they'll believe. So here's the answer. Luke chapter 16 and verse 30. Luke 16 and verse 30. No, Father Abraham, if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will surely repent. And then Abraham said to him, if they don't listen to Moses and the prophets, they will surely not be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. So no, someone rising from the dead would not have persuaded the Jews. And it didn't. It didn't. They perpetuated... Yeah. They perpetuated lies. They did everything they could to stop it. And of course, you're not going to stop God's plan. When they couldn't stop it, they did everything they did to kill it. And... <laughs> the empty tomb and I had the conversation and that was all it took um, 
the aha card, if I give you guys an aha card, all you would need to draw someone's attention to is think about, ask your, your friend or whoever, think about all of the famous people that ever left their mark in the world. All of them have a monument where their dead body is buried. And then have a conversation about that. Gandhi is buried somewhere. Muhammad is buried somewhere. Joseph Smith is buried somewhere. Anybody that ever made a splash in society has got a monument where they're buried. Where is Jesus buried? And then just let that hang. And they'll say, the tomb was empty. And when you hear them say that, it's such a powerful moment. And so that was what happened this weekend. Tomb was empty. So there's point number two, the available data. What kind of a conclusion do we draw from the available data? Uh, let me give you guys Wit, Wit, Wittgenstein's Poker. It's not a card game. Uh, uh, let me Wittgenstein Wittgenstein's Poker this is not a card game Wittgenstein's Poker is a famous event that was documented uh, about 1946 this guy Wittgenstein was a famous philosopher at um, Cambridge University, I think it's in London, and they invited another famous philosopher that this guy Wittgenstein and the other guy, I think his name was Pross, I don't remember. They butted heads over philosophy. Pross wanted to argue that there were weaknesses in philosophical arguments, in philosophy. Wittgenstein did not like someone saying that philosophy had, had inherent errors. So he said, no, these aren't errors. These are just puzzles. This just makes it interesting. So these guys got in a huge argument on the Cambridge campus. Okay. So there's this debate. I, I think the guy's name was Pross. I don't remember. Okay, there's this debate, Pross versus Wittgenstein. And this thing got heated, and they got really angry at each other. And at some point, a fire poker. You guys know what that is? Yeah. Okay. It's one of the things in Clue. <laughs> <laughs> the fire poker is one of the things in the game Clue. That's how you kill somebody. At some point in this heated conversation, a fire poker gets brought out. Now, what's interesting about the account, Wittgenstein's poker is what it's called, is there are all kinds of testimonies about why the poker came out. The people that were actually at this lecture have all kinds of interpretations about the story of the poker. For instance, one of the stories is that Wittgenstein took his poker, his poker, because they were at his office there in Cambridge or whatever, and he merely used it to point to some evidence on the chalkboard. But another account that's recorded is no, that when Wittgenstein um, got challenged by Pross or whatever the guy's name was, he picked up the poker in anger and threw it on the ground. And somebody else said, no, Wittgenstein just had the poker in his hand and he was just using it as like a, an item of comfort for himself. So there's something really important about Wittgenstein's poker and the accounts, the differing accounts of the people that attended this lecture. There are differing accounts about what happened to that fire poker. Now, because there are different accounts of exactly what happened to the fire poker, does anybody deny that Wittgenstein and Pross had a heated debate? <laughs> <laughs> Who 
the frivolous details are on the outside don't diminish the reality of the debate. And so I give that to you because there are some that want to say, well, you can't believe the resurrection because there are different versions of it. Some say that there was one woman that went to the tomb. Another version is there were several women at the tomb. One version said there was two angels inside the tomb. One, angel said, one version said there was an angel outside on the rock. But we learn from Wittgenstein's poker that even though the accounts vary, nobody denies that the body was still gone. 